Uh, they are Dr. Tammy Eager and Mallory LaDuke, a PhD student from Crosh and Laurentian University. So while they uh, get our slides up, I'll, uh, I'll just, uh, you know, thank you for coming. I know the, uh, the day was uh, probably a challenge for everybody with the snow, but I'm glad everybody made it safely. Uh, CROSH stands for the Center for Research and Occupational Safety and Health, and we are a research center at Laurentian University, and uh, we look at uh, a number of health and safety issues facing workplaces in the north. So if you haven't heard about us, by all means, reach out at some point. We're involved uh, with OCAO as uh, one of our partner organizations, so we, we do a fair bit of work together. So Trevor, thank you for inviting us here today. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking to you about uh, whole body vibration, uh, hand arm vibration and foot transmitted vibration, or basically all the types of vibration exposure that you may experience within the workplace. And Mallory and I are going to tag team, so when, uh, uh, you'll get to hear a little bit from both of us. We'll cover the health risks, how you evaluate vibration, and then what are some of the prevention strategies. And hopefully uh, you can each take some of those home and back into your own workplaces. So to start with, as I said, there's three different types of vibration that individuals could be exposed to. If we think about the typical lift truck, you get hand arm exposure when you are in contact with the uh, steering wheel, for example. You can also get hand arm vibration exposure if you're operating drills or, or impact equipment. So your typical mechanics would have a lot of hand arm vibration exposure. Whole body then is what we most typically experience when we're driving vehicles. So in this case, whole body is coming through the seat of that vehicle. Uh, uh, yourself, when you're driving through some of the rougher roads in Sudbury, you hit those potholes, that's uh, whole body vibration you're experiencing. And then you can also get vibration through the feet, foot transmitted vibration, uh, the pedals of, of these types of vehicles, but also uh, in the mining industry in particular, when you're standing on, on platforms or vehicles, uh, tr jumbo drills, uh, things like that, that will vibrate and put vibration through your feet. When we're looking at trying to understand the health effects, there's four factors that become really important. So the first is the, the magnitude, and that's really, if you like, sort of the size of the bounce or the, the amplitude of the signal. So again, if you imagine you're driving over a really rough road and it's, it's uh, got a lot of potholes, and if you're, you're driving at a fairly fast speed, you're going to get a high magnitude of vibration. So that's the, uh, the bounce height, if you like. Frequency then is, is sort of the cycles per second or the bounces per second. I'm going to talk more about that. We need to know the, the duration of exposure and we need to know the direction. So you can be exposed to vibration in the vertical direction. You can get four aft side to side and those become important as well. The reason frequency is so important is people will often ask this, it's like, well, when I'm exposed to uh, or operating this piece of equipment, I have more problems with my hands. But when I'm operating this piece of equipment, my back hurts. And the reason being is that the frequency makes a big difference. So there's different body regions that are more affected by vibration uh, at different frequencies. So uh, for example, if any of you have operated a whippersnipper in the summer, you're cutting your grass, that's a little bit of a higher frequency, typically 30 to 40 hertz. And that's why you get the tingling in the hands, so it affects your hands. Uh, low back is more affected at, at lower frequencies, so 3 to 5 hertz. So that's the lower frequency you get when you're driving typically on a road. And you can see that, uh, you know, the eye for example, if you're on a really rough road and, and if you're getting a 20 to 25 hertz signal, you may have uh, problems with your eyes, with your, with your head. So that's why sometimes feel, people feel nauseous. Sometimes they have different regions of their body that will uh, bother them. Okay, so now I'm going to turn it over to Mallory to talk a little bit more about health risks in particular. And uh, we will have time for questions at the end, so by all means, uh, keep those if you've got a few points. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to just go through the health risks here for you for um, looking at, again, whole body vibration, the foot transmitted, and the hand transmitted vibration, and what we can learn um, about each of them. And while still keeping in mind, as Tammy said, um, understanding how the different um, frequencies influence the body and uh, how we can look out for this uh, for ourselves or for the, the workers that we, uh, that we try to protect. Um, so when we look at whole body vibration again, this is when uh, typically the workers are uh, in a seated posture and the vibration again is coming up 
um, through uh, the buttocks area. So most commonly we do see uh, lower back pain, spinal degeneration, and neck problems. So we can see structural damage and, um, and other issues that uh, influence the, uh, the spinal column of, of the workers. Also uh, muscle fatigue and sleep problems, uh, headaches, and gastrointestinal tract issues are other uh, complaints of workers who are often uh, seated uh, in these uh, postures and receiving uh, vibration throughout the day. So again, this would be in the one to 20 hertz range. And as you would see, that would correspond back to what Tammy mentioned for the resonant frequency of, of uh, the, lower, the lower range for the, uh, the back. And of uh, more concern too, is when we look at these workers when they're in a non-neutral posture. So when their, um, their neck is rotated or their trunk is rotated, these, um, these workers in either the mining industry or in agriculture where they are either operating the vehicle going in one direction, have to look at the other, or where, depending on where their load is, um, that we see that there is a higher risk for low back injury when you're, co you're combining both your, um, your vibration exposure and this non-neutral posture of operating the equipment. When we switch over to foot transmitted vibration, it is <clears throat> a relatively newer, um, less, uh, less evidence, I should say, um, for uh, documenting this. But there is a case report in 2010, which was the first one, and this documented um, uh, a 54-year-old male who was um, in the mining industry for over 35 years and specifically 18 years on the bolter. So he did, um, in their description of the work description, it was mainly um, vibration through the foot and the way their controls were set up uh, was relatively low through the hand. So he did experience pain and numbness in the toes and feet and uh, this is why uh, the case report went forward. So you can see when they did do their plasmography, you can see at the top that their hands, um, the waveform showing the blood flow in the hands was normal. But when you look at uh, the foot, so before showing the normal uh, waveforms, but after, um, after cold stress, you can see the uh, decrease in blood circulation. You can see the dampening of the, of the signal. When we switch over to hand-arm vibration, you can see that there are three different uh, components when we look at the health risks for hand-arm vibration. So there's typically a vascular component, a neurological component, and a muscular component. So when we look at the vascular, this is affecting uh, the circulatory system. So this is where you see um, the blanching and the decreased blood flow in the hands. When we look at the neurological, this is influencing um, the nerve. So this is where you're damaging the sensory to the hand and the fingers. So a worker would experience tum uh, tingling and numbness in their fingers and hands and would um, influence their dexterity, right? Because it's influencing the sensitivity of their fingers. Um, also muscle, uh, muscle disorders, musculoskeletal disorders here. So you can see that they ha would have a decrease in grip strength and over time, their, uh, again, their manual um, dexterity and, and strength of their hands and fingers definitely, um, definitely goes down. Visually, when we look at the vascular component, uh, as you can uh, most often see, is uh, the blanching of the fingers. So this may begin at the tips of the fingers and gradually, as it worsens, um, continue down uh, one or more of the fingers. And now Tammy will uh, discuss how we, from if we are identifying these health risks, how we can uh, evaluate and measure them. Thanks, Mallory. We're, we're hoping by this tag team approach that uh, you won't get tired of listening to either of us for too long, so we'll keep switching it around. So as, as Mallory said, uh, we, we understand that there are health effects, but how do we know whether the workers uh, or ourselves, if we're exposed to vibration, whether we're at risk? Well, there, there are some standards that exist that tell us how we should measure vibration in the workplace, and then there are some criterion values that we can use to indicate are we above or below those values, and that gives us an indication of risk. Uh, there are a number uh, of standards. The most common ones I've highlighted there in, in bold. So for whole body, it's, it's the international standard 2631-1. For hand arm, it's the international standard 5349-1. Uh, if uh, your company does work in Europe as well, there's a European Union directive. Um, if that's the case, you can always give me a call after and I can give you some more information on that standard. But today I'm just going to talk about the two ISO standards. 
Now, within Ontario, it's important to note that, that there is no specific guidelines. So what's used then, if you're concerned about vibration in the workplace, is the general duty clause. So although these international standards exist, it's not law in Ontario that your workers have to be exposed to values below that. But if you do feel that there is vibration issues, uh, you can use this general duty clause to have an assessment performed. Okay, when we're looking at measuring whole body vibration then, uh, typically what's used is a triaxial accelerometer and that's placed typically within a seat pad, which is that rubber disc that you see there. Uh, that's then placed on the seat, usually secured with something as fancy as duct tape just to keep it in place. And, uh, and then you use a data logger or some type of a computer uh, to collect the signal. So that's typically what's, what's done. So you can see our fancy duct tape uh, situation there. Uh, and, and again, you're measuring vibration in the vertical, the forward and back, and the side to side direction. Now, what's important when we look at the standard, how long do you need to measure for? You don't typically need to measure for an entire day, but you need to make sure you're measuring long enough that it's representative of the work that's being performed. So if you have a driver that's, for example, let's say if you're a city bus driver and you're, you're driving the same route over and over, it would be typical that you might just measure for that driving route and then you could extrapolate to what your eight hour exposure would be. But if you have somebody that's, that's driving in different areas over different terrain and their task is quite variable throughout the day, you would really need to measure all of those sections of their job to get a representative sample, okay? Then what's happened is, is the values are compared to what's called the health guidance caution zone. And there, there's values that uh, for an eight hour day that we wanna be below, okay? And what those values are, are, are shown here. So according to the standard, if you're looking at an, an A8 value is called your frequency weighted um, um, RMS acceleration. I'm not gonna go into the math behind what the frequency weighting is. The standard tells you how to do that frequency weighting and most of your measurement equipment will do it appropriately. If you have specific measurement uh, questions after, you can always get a hold of me and I can uh, try to go through those. But what we know is if you are exposed to vibration above a 0.9, uh, it, it means that health risks are likely. So that's a, an eight hour equivalent frequency weighted RMS acceleration, which is your A8 value. A VDV is called a vibration dose value. That value is used if you have a lot more potential impacts or very rough uh, road conditions where you're gonna have a lot more variability in your signal and it's just another value that you can use to compare, okay? Uh, so here's an example from a, a typical uh, load haul dump vehicle in mining and, and what you see then is the A8 value on the, uh, the um, vertical axis. So again, that's your eight hour equivalent frequency weighted RMS acceleration plotted against that health guidance caution zone. So green's below, yellow's within, and red is above. And you can see for many of the samples when we, we've taken over the years for load haul dump vehicles would indicate that those operators are typically exposed either within the guidance caution zone or above, which would tell us that health risks for things like that Mallory talked about, like low back pain, neck problems, gastrointestinal tract problems are likely. Okay. Now, uh, having said that, I just told you you need some fancy equipment to measure whole body vibration. Uh, uh, researchers out of the University of Australia and uh, folks from our lab have been working together and we've actually validated uh, an application that you can download for free and you can use uh, your iPhone, uh, iPhone or your iPod is a vibration measurement machine. So the accelerometers have gotten actually good enough in those devices that you can use it as an initial screening for whole body vibration. So uh, there's the link there for more information if you want to uh, try uh, measuring your own exposure on some of the Sudbury roads. You'll be surprised. I think you'll, you'll see you're in the yellow and, and, you know, so having said that, our bus drivers, our taxi drivers are actually exposed to levels that could put them at some increased risk for low back problems. Okay, but what if you don't have access to measure anything uh, directly? Well, there are published data sources that exist, and if you know something about the type of equipment you're using, you can use those published data sources to try to, again, estimate what your exposure is. Okay, so things that are important, the type of equipment, the class of equipment, uh, if it has any uh, suspension features that might uh, attenuate vibration, uh, operating speed becomes really important in understanding the surface that you're operating on. Uh, but so for example, this, this chart here is from the uh, EU Good Practice Guide to Whole Body Vibration. And what you're seeing there in the, in the uh, 
orange is, is basically saying from all the published data that we have, we're going to sort of give you the 25th to the 75th percentile for what exposure has been reported for those vehicles. So it gives you a kind of an, a range, and you can see it's, it's quite variable. If we were to look at the asphalt paver, I mean, the lowest value was about a 0.1, and the highest value is off the charts at 2 meters per second squared big difference. So it does show you that there's lots of variability and that has to do with the speed, the road conditions, the maintenance of the vehicle. But if you don't have any way of measuring, at least you have a rough idea of where uh, your exposures might be. Uh, there's also a database if you're able to work in French. There's a, a nice database out of uh, um, one of the French Health and Safety Associations that allows you to pick the type of, uh, of vehicle and it'll give you an estimation of what your A8 exposure would be if you put in the duration. So it's a, it's a, a, a handy database for some individuals. Okay, so that's basically a quick overview of whole body vibration measurement. And uh, again, you use your health guidance caution zone in terms of trying to understand exposure and, and risk. And I'm going to turn it over to Mallory now, and she's going to tell you a little bit about measuring uh, foot transmitted and hand transmitted vibration. All right, so when we look at um, foot transmitted vibration, as I mentioned before with the, um, the initial case study only coming out in 2010, the standards for how we, um, or how it's uh, regulated on how, what the proper procedures are for measuring it and reporting it aren't as clear cut as they are for whole body vibration and hand arm vibration. So we could, s I'll present a few, um, a few um, of the results that I had actually from my master's thesis that um, that'll bring out how uh, how there's still confusion on uh, on which standard would be best or potentially a new standard for foot transmitted vibration. So when we did take some foot transmitted vibration uh, measurements from a raised worker, um, these were both on metal raised and wooden platforms. We saw that 100 percent of the workers that we uh, measured did have a report that they had. Um, hand arm vibration syndrome and actually 75% did have um, vibration induced white foot so they were experiencing um, pain, discomfort and the uh, vascular neurological muscular um, um, sorry um, um, problems in their foot sorry so when we look at um, the raised workers, they were the ones that were exposed to the greatest magnitude of vibration. So we looked at other workers that were operating locomotives, jumbos, um, and the raised workers were the most concerning um, going forward. And they had a docu uh, dominant exposure of 40 hertz. So when we look at how this is um, related to uh, the dominant frequency, this is more in line with what we would see for hand arm vibration syndrome. But when we look at other uh, pieces of equipment that we did measure, from the locomotive, they were a lot lower, so they were more in the dominant frequency, three to six range, um, which would be more um, congruent with whole body vibration. And when this came out, when we asked the workers to report where they were experiencing discomfort, where they were experiencing pain, um, we saw, you could see the, um, the dominant frequency less than six, it was more of systemic. Um, so that the workers were reported experiencing um, discomfort throughout their whole body, neck, back, um, knees, and legs. So these would be the operators that were uh, operating the locomotives. Um, so experiencing a lower dominant frequency, but still in a standing posture. Um, when we looked at the, again, the uh, jumbo drill, the bolters, and the race, you can see um, the pain, discomfort, and the symptoms uh, surrounding the hand and feet. Also, there is, um, again, all over, but we, we, they also did have diagnosed cases of hand arm vibration syndrome, which would lead us to, um, to think that perhaps um, just measuring it with the whole body standard may not be the best approach, and that potentially, um, when you take your measurements, to take into consideration the hand arm vibration um, uh, standard as well. So when we look at hand arm vibration, um, there is the international standard. So as Tammy mentioned, the ISO 5349. So again, not to go into too much of it, but this is uh, where you want to go if you are planning on taking measurements in, in your workplace. So again, you would follow these guidelines. They're standardized as to how you would um, go through and collect these measurements in order to make sure that they are uh, comparable and reproducible um, in comparison to other tools. 
So again, as Tammy mentioned, um, securing the accelerometer is always important, and I'll get to that in a few minutes, but also, again, the sufficient duration. So you want to make sure that your samples that you're taking are comparable to the work exposure that your workers are actually receiving. And again, that you're operating it under conditions that are regular to their operating procedures is always best case scenario. So that if you're actually taking the measurements while they're working on, a, you know, the regular set of equipment um, under the normal environmental conditions, um, that sort of thing, under the same sort of stress that they, they may be under, um, is, is definitely ideal. So again, here's just a picture of the uh, triaxial accelerometer, so you can get smaller ones to to do the hand arm vibration uh, measurements so that doesn't impair the, um, the hands of the worker while they're doing it. Again, the standard goes through the specific attachment points, so they have specific uh, guidelines as to where you attach the accelerometer for the different uh, types of equipment that may be out there and the different types of uh, handling that the worker will, and coupling that the worker will have with the tool. Again, duration is important. So uh, also when you're considering hand arm vibration, you need to look at um, whether it's continuous exposure or intermittent exposure, and trigger time is the, uh, the important thing. So you need to document while you are taking your measurements how long the worker is actually um, holding on to the piece of equipment. So um, whether you're saying that they're operating a chainsaw for you know, one hour, two hours, that sort of thing, but how long are they actually um, handling the chainsaw with it uh, running um, as opposed to picking it up, putting it down, that sort of thing. So that's really important to get an understanding of how long the worker um, is being exposed and how, how long the vibration is coming in through the hand arm system. Uh, again, not to bore you with too much math, but um, they are collecting it in the X, Y, and Z axis, and then through the math, um, we come up with a vibration total value, and less than two meters per second squared would be, um, symptoms would be rare, and then above that, we would expect to see symptoms from our workers. Again, this is from, as Tammy showed, for whole body vibration. Here's for hand arm vibration. So you can see uh, the vibration total value of two meters per second squared in the red line. And you can see that the majority of the, the common tools that could be used are, are above this, uh, suggesting that workers who are operating this um, may be uh, experiencing symptoms and, uh, and having health, uh, health impacts as a result of this. So again, you can see, you can see the range of, uh, of what the, the values could potentially be for all the uh, document exposures of them. That's why it is important for, um, for workplaces to have their, the vibration measured to see how, uh, what the worker actually is being exposed to rather than always, uh, when you rely on the, uh, the recorded data that there is such a range, so it could, it could vary a lot. Um, there also are, again, online tools, so you can uh, go on the website here, and if you know your vibration total value, you can enter it in, and then it will tell you uh, what the daily exposure is for that tool and, and give you the, uh, the time guidelines. Um, some tool manufacturers are also coming out with their own exposure calculators. So here you can, again, if you know the vibration uh, value input, you're able to calculate what the exposure duration uh, is on there. So a few other resources for you to uh, take a look at if you're interested more. All right, so Tammy's going to look at now when we understand the health risks and how we're measuring it, what can we uh, do about it? Okay, so, so far, as Mallory said, we've, we've talked about the types of vibration you can be exposed to, we've talked about how you could measure, and uh, we've talked a little bit about the criterion values that might indicate whether you're at risk, but if you do find that you're exposed to vibration in the workplace that may put you at risk for one of those health effects, how can we look at trying to control those risks? So I'll start with uh, some control strategies for whole body vibration. Okay, you guys are all uh, uh, health and safety folks in this room, or I'm sure have been to a number of different uh, talks before, so I'm, I'm sure you're quite familiar with the hierarchy of controls. So vibration as a hazard is no different. We try to use the hierarchy of controls when looking at the best uh, control strategy. So elimination is always uh, ideal, but in many cases it's, it's not practical. So if you can, though, eliminate somebody from exposure to vibration, then that's where you start. If you can find something where you can substitute, uh, that's your next step. 
but in many cases we're dealing with with what are the engineering solutions what are the administrative solutions and are there any uh, types of personal protective equipment so that's where we'll we'll talk a little bit so again uh, some of the just general uh, strategies you can use as I said you can remove the worker from the vibration source if at all possible and in some cases that happens there is some uh, some movement in some industries where uh, equipment's now being operated from a tele remote station so the workers not physically on the equipment the entire time that it's uh, operating so that removes some of their exposure uh, purchasing equipment with lower vibration emissions or exposure that's really really critical and in many cases uh, you know individuals that are in charge of making purchasing decisions within the workplace aren't necessarily aware that vibration is a factor and they don't ask the manufacturers of those pieces of equipment what are the vibration uh, emission values so if you do have the ability to make purchasing decisions it's really important that you ask those equipment manufacturers if you're looking at, at buying a new bus for example for urban city driving or if you're looking at buying a new piece of uh, mobile equipment for mining or construction you can ask the equipment manufacturer have you done any assessments what is the vibration exposure at the operators level what type of suspension is in that vehicle are there special seats that have been put in to help to reduce the exposure to the operator so that's really really critical if you can start to have that process uh, implemented it's going to make a big difference I'm going to talk about uh, road maintenance in a, in a little bit and driving speed and some of these other factors as I move forward Okay, so this was a, a, a particular study. So our, our research team worked with a, a mining equipment manufacturer and we really did want to show uh, once and for all that uh, lower driving speeds make a, a significant difference in reducing an operator's exposure to vibration. So what you see here is on the vertical is the frequency weighted, again, root mean squared acceleration. The higher that value, the greater the risk for injury for the operator. And at the bottom you see we have gear one, gear two, gear three, and, uh, and what's called auto shift or gear four. Really what we want to get to the point is the faster you drive, the more vibration exposure you will experience. So we're not suggesting that everyone's going to be able to operate in gear one, but what we are suggesting is within, again, the design of work that there's realistic operating speeds put in place for the type of production that is expected. So you can't, on one hand, tell the workers drive slower, but then bump up their production expectations. There has to be a real understanding of how much work can actually get done in a time frame that can allow them to operate at a speed that is both safe, but also will uh, help to reduce their exposure. So driving speed makes a difference. Uh, it also makes a difference whether those vehicles are loaded or unloaded. So again, another example from this particular mining vehicle. So this would be important for dump truck uh, operators. Anyone that's operating a large piece of equipment, when it's not loaded, when it doesn't have that extra mass in it, it's going to vibrate more. So again, you want to think about potentially having lower speeds when that vehicle is empty. And in many cases, what we see is when the vehicle's empty, it's driving even faster. Right? And the problem is now that operator is getting exposed to even more vibration. So again, you can see the difference between the loaded bucket versus the empty bucket. And you think, well, maybe that's not that much, but we're looking at a magnitude of about 1.9 and fourth gear empty versus a magnitude of about 1.25, 1.3 when it's loaded. So remember, when we looked at the health guidance caution zone, anything above 0.9 puts you at an uh, increased risk for injury. So, uh, you know, we really do need to consider the load of the vehicle as well. Road conditions make a big difference. I mean, you've all driven on roads that have been newly paved versus roads that have lots of potholes. It's the same for our industrial uh, equipment operators. If you're driving on a road that's had a greater go over it recently, has realistic road maintenance conditions versus something that has got a lot of potholes, broken muck or rock, it makes a big difference. So in here, what you're seeing is the red is the vibration exposure for the same speed on an unmaintained road and blue is for the maintained road. So road maintenance makes a big difference. And again, even within a city environment, if you're a taxi driver, an urban bus driver, you'll understand where those rough roads are and how challenging that can be. So again, making sure your workplace has a comprehensive road maintenance program is really important. Seats, okay, I'm gonna spend a little bit more time. I think I have time still, Mal, so I'm gonna talk about seats a little bit longer. Seats make a big difference. 
the tricky thing is you can't pick the ideal seat for your particular vehicle just because it looks pretty and it has the word ergonomic on it. And that's a challenge, I realize, for many individuals because uh, even the manufacturers may give you the indication that that seat is suited for the vehicle that you want to put it in within the environment in which it's going to operate. But unless they've specifically tested it in that environment, you won't know for sure whether that's the best seat. I give this example. So what you see here on this, uh, this figure, again, is your frequency-weighted RMS acceleration is on the vertical. And uh, the exposure, vibration exposure measured at the seat is shown in blue. And the exposure we measured below the seat is shown in red. And it's hard for you to probably see on this, this image, but trust me, the blue is higher than the red. So what that means is this seat here is actually amplifying the vibration and, and exposing the worker to more vibration. Said another way, this worker would be better to be sitting on a rigid metal seat than this particular seat. So just think about that for a second. It may be labeled ergonomic. In fact, it was. This was a new seat this company was trying out. It had all the fancy ergonomic features. You could dress the lumbar support, move it up and down. It looked really pretty. It was well labeled. But from a perspective of being able to deal with vibration, it didn't have the right suspension mechanisms within it to deal with the type of exposure. Okay, remember way back early on, I talked to you about resonant frequency, how each region of the body responds differently to a certain type of frequency. Well, the, the vehicle seats have a natural frequency or resonance as well. So there's a certain frequency at which that seat will maximally uh, vibrate and will amplify a signal that goes through it. So it's really important that we understand the type of vibration we're exposed to so that the proper seat can be selected for the conditions in which that worker is going to be operating. Uh, uh, said another way, there's a, a research team out of um, the UK who looked at uh, 100 different seats from 14 different vehicles. And this should shock everybody. 94% of the vehicles evaluated would have had better vibration attenuation if a seat from one of the other vehicles tested in the study was in that vehicle versus the one that was actually originally installed by the manufacturer. 94%. Okay, so again, seat selection can be challenging, but it's really important. So what our uh, research team did, we worked with, uh, with the mining and, and forestry and construction industry, and we took 30 of the most common vibration profiles that we had collected over the years from those three industries, and we looked at evaluating the performance of five commercially available seats. And how we did that is what you're seeing here is, is sort of a robotic motion platform. So when we collect the vibration uh, information in the field, we can feed this into this robotic platform and it replicates it. So it, we could say, okay, replicate the profile for an urban bus, replicate the profile for a skidder, for a load haul dump vehicle operator, that sort of thing. And it'll shake the person up. It's a really good ride. Normally you'd pay a lot of money for that at the uh, midway, right? But uh, we have our, our participants come in here and experience this for... Uh, as part of our study. Okay, so then what you get is what's called a, a SIET value, which is a ratio of the vibration that you measure at the floor to the vibration at the seat. And you want that value to be less than one or less than 100. That would tell us that the seat was attenuating the vibration and not amplifying it. Okay, so here this graph is going to be a, a little bit tricky, but the, the C at value is on the vertical. So where you see the one, I apologize, there's no laser pointer, but about midway up the graph you see a one, and really only about a quarter of those signals are below one. So this tells us the majority of those seats in most of the circumstances amplified the vibration. The only seat that actually performed really well was the seat that's shown with the green triangle, and that was one that uh, was manufactured by uh, CAT in this particular circumstance. So what this tells us, if they were being exposed to the vibration signals that were more similar to between two to three uh, in terms of the magnitude and the frequency associated with uh, uh, the signals that we were putting in from construction, forestry, and mining, that seat would perform the best. But you can see in other circumstances, there were other seats that performed better. So again, you have to understand the type of vehicle that you're, you're testing. So we were able to uh, identify the seat that would be best for that particular industry. Okay, so that was uh, sort of an overview of whole body vibration, and Mal's gonna come up and talk about foot transmitted uh, vibration and hand arm controls. Okay. 
Okay, so when we, again, switching back to foot transmitted hand arm vibration, um, again, removing the worker from the vibration source may not always be um, applicable for every uh, workplace. So we want to look at, again, purchasing equipment, as Tammy mentioned, and I'll show some uh, data that supports that as well. Again, the maintenance of the equipment um, is the same as, as whole body when with maintenance of any of your vehicles and, and that sort of thing. Um, and again, isolated platforms for workers to stand on, so I'll get into that um, as well. So here for looking at hand arm vibration reduction with a, a drill with an anti-vibration um, different type of handle. So you can see here that the, the conventional handle had <clears throat> accelerations of above 20. And then with this anti-vibration handle that was engineered specifically for the rock drill, you can see that it brought it down uh, quite significantly. So if we can, as uh, industry and health, uh, health and safety professionals, continue to um, demand that the um, that the engineering and that the um, that the tool manufacturers consider vibration as a hazard and uh, work to identify solutions that we can actually reduce these uh, values quite significantly. When we look at an example from foot transmitted vibration, this is from um, a jack leg being operated on a metal raise. And here we had, we took measurements using uh, a, the typical uh, jack leg, again, on the metal raise. And then you can see the one that's lowered in, uh, in yellow is the jack leg using um, an anti-vibration leg attachment um, instead of the, uh, the typical one. So you can see that the vibration levels were, um, were reduced from above the health guidance caution zone um, down to within the health guidance caution zone. So here even, um, not that it's simple, but um, a modification to the engineering of how the, uh, the tool and how the jack leg is operated um, significantly reduced the vibration levels that the worker was experiencing from the jack leg coming up uh, through their feet. Um, here again, we looked at um, we looked at measurements on a jumbo platform, and we took measurements um, on a, the jumbo that did not have the isolated platform, and then again on ones that had a specifically engineered platform where the worker would stand. So, although the worker didn't always um, specifically stand um, in this area, it did have a significant reduction, again, on the vibration. You can, so you can see that through their engineering, um, they were able to dampen the vibration in that specific location. So if the worker is operating the controls in that area, you can see from the graph where um, the solid platform is in blue, and then the isolated platform, um, the engineering design, um, is in red. So you can see the reduction in vibration. So again, um, without eliminating the vibration, the worker still has to perform their job duties, but for uh, engineering solutions like this are really, um, are really the, the way to uh, reduce vibration the most. So again, if we can continue to um, make that a priority in purchasing, purchasing decisions and uh, have companies um, provide a, a reduction in vibration emissions for their, their products is, uh, is definitely the way uh, to protect the workers, the, the best case scenario. Um, again, for um, for the tools for hand arm um, is is maintenance is uh, is very important and re and replacement programs. So again, we want to make sure that the workers are are, are replacing uh, any work um, tools that are are not performing well, so that keep them sharp and replacing any damaged um, any damaged tools will definitely impact the uh, vibration that the workers. Um, that is experiencing, so whether or not they're gripping harder because it's not as sharp or, um, or you know, having to lean in and then that will cause other uh, issues as well. So again, when we look at um, PPE, although not, um, when we think back to the hierarchy of controls, definitely on the bottom, but um, there are um, anti-vibration gloves that, um, although the research is still um, mixed out there on, uh, on how, uh, effective they are. So there are positives where they keep the hands um, dry and warm and, uh, and the certified ones do um, will reduce vibration levels above uh, 200 hertz and if they are certified again will not uh, amplify the lower uh, frequencies. Um, but again they can also increase the grip that the worker is, uh, is holding and increase fatigue. So um, sometimes it uh, again engineering is, uh, is the way to go. But 
we do, there are positives to the anti-vibration gloves. And when we did um, look at how we can uh, uh, implement these and as look at this as a, a method of safety behavior. So just to talk a little bit about intervention that was uh, conducted, um, I came in uh, to this project on the tail end of it, but a team of researchers from uh, the Center for Research in Occupational Disease um, created a one-page double-side laminated document for hand-arm vibration syndrome for the construction, construction industry. So they wanted to see if they could disseminate information about hand-arm vibration syndrome through the occupational health clinic as opposed to uh, through the workplace directly. So there are challenges in um, getting work, uh, getting information out in construction industry, um, depending on if the workers are um, working alone or working on multiple sites. So they thought this would be a potential different route to disseminate the uh, information. So again, the, the intervention was a laminated document to withstand the elements and was a convenient form. So it was short and quick and that the workers were each given three to share amongst their, their work, uh, respective workplace back at, at their workplace. So here's just a picture of what the document looked like. Um, it is uh, older now, so um, part of my thesis will actually be uh, reinventing this and, and, uh, and going through it and seeing how we can uh, change it up a little bit. But you can see that it does have some short, quick bullet points. Um, workers are able to see you know, what hand arm vibration is, how common is it, uh, quick pictures to show uh, visually what they, uh, what they may be looking for there. And then there also was information for employers, so what they can do, again, kind of what we talked about here, about where their control strategies, intervention strategies, and how they can reduce uh, exposure. So again, all the information uh, from you know, this hour presentation packed into one document um, that could be easily uh, read, and then provided uh, direction for where the workers could go for additional resources. So we, um, it was given to 100 uh, construction workers, so again, through the occupational health clinic as opposed to directly at the uh, work site. And uh, they filled out a questionnaire and they had their hand arm vibration assessment at the clinic. And then two months later, um, a follow-up questionnaire was sent out and unfortunately only 57 um, did provide results to this, but it still was uh, able to indicate some uh, interesting trends. So we also want to look at what kind of um, health and safety training they are receiving surrounding anti-vibration gloves and uh, those control strategies as well as hand-arm vibration. So were they getting that education uh, within their workplaces? And we also want to look at um, following the intervention, did they um, improve or did they increase their glove use? So more looking at it as um, as a way of they receive this education and now are taking a step towards uh, protecting themselves. So when we look at the results for the health and safety training, you can see at the top that um, very few workers indicated that they were receiving any training uh, specifically related to hand arm vibration syndrome and anti-vibration gloves. So when we look at the, um, the regulated training and the mandatory training, you can see that the majority did, um, did indicate that they were receiving that, but specifically to hand arm vibration is, is uh, potentially still lacking. In this case was the construction industry, but we wanted to know, um, again, was this an effective way of delivering um, an intervention for an occupational health and safety um, topic? So we wanted to know, again, they gave uh, three copies of each resource to the workers. So we wanted to know, did they share this? So are you able to um, infiltrate the workplace through the occupational health clinic? So you can see that the, the mixes, uh, the varying uh, sharing for each of them is uh, is mixed, so you can see that the majority did share with their co-workers at 68 percent, and um, sorry, and less with with the employer and and supervisor. But this may also just be um, based on convenience. So when they return to their workplace, maybe they see their co-workers more than their uh, supervisor, employee, that employer, that sort of thing. <clears throat> 
Um, but when we look at the anti-vibration glove use before and after, so this um, was previously presented by Dr. Thompson and Dr. House, we did see a significant improvement in their, their anti-vibration glove use um, pre-education and post-education. So this was a significant difference of the workers reporting that only 4% uh, wore anti-vibration gloves before and, on, and then up to uh, over 50% afterwards. And then when we look at, um, we did a logistic regression to see what the key predictors of wearing your gloves were after. And we did find um, the most significant uh, predictors were, were sharing the resource with their supervisor and being employed at a workplace with more than 20 employees. So back to the previous one, we see that only, actually only 45% of the workers did share the resource with their supervisor, but they were actually the group that was most likely to continue wearing the gloves or begin wearing the gloves afterwards. So here this points to the importance of uh, the supervisor and the role that they can play in uh, improving and uh, having their workers achieve uh, health and safety behaviors. So again, um, that the workers who did uh, share with their supervisor would be six times more likely to wear their gloves following the uh, education uh, resource intervention. Um, switching now to foot transmitted vibration, um, some research that's been done at CROSH by uh, fellow researchers uh, is looking at, again, um, p some PPE solutions, although uh, I guess can't stress enough the, uh, the importance of engineering uh, control strategies, but we did look at um, measuring uh, mats, boots, and insoles. So we had a variety of commonly used uh, anti-vibration or anti-fatigue matting that um, workers in the mining industry t um, potentially will use when they're standing on um, a bolter or a jumbo operator or jumbo drill, sorry. And then we also had a variety of boots that are typically used, again, throughout the industry um, within Sudbury. And then insoles, so these would be anti, um, these would be anti-vibration insoles or insoles that um, would be anti-fatigue that, again, that were taken from uh, insoles that are being used within the industry. And when we did um, do field testing and lab testing, uh, the combination that seemed to reduce vibration the most was the combination of MAT1, BOOT3, and insole2. So the Center for Research and Occupational Safety and Health is uh, continually working on um, developing these strategies and, and testing um, the variety of uh, control strategies that are being uh, utilized and then hopefully implemented within the field. All right, so I'll turn it over to Tammy to continue on. If uh, you do have some information about what MAT1, BOOT3 and INSOL2 actually mean, you can email me and I'll, uh, I'll share those specifics. We're almost ready to publicly indicate the manufacturers, but probably about another three weeks away before we can officially release that report. Okay, so just as a summary, today we've told you a little bit about whole body, hand, arm, and uh, foot transmitted vibration and some of the challenges. So again, just to, to reiterate, Depending on the type of vibration you're exposed to, your health risks are going to be different. So for your operators that are sitting and exposed to vibration, they're more likely to have problems associated with back disorders, neck disorders, gastrointestinal tract problems. If you're exposed to higher frequency uh, at your segments, so hand, arm, or foot transmitted vibration, you're more likely to have the tingling and numbness that could lead to permanent neurological damage. Vascular problems, that's where you get the blanching of your fingers. You'll see the blanching of the toes as well. That can, again, is, is a permanent uh, problem and decreased grip strength. So again, what I want to reiterate with segmental exposure in particular is the damage is permanent. Once it's happened, you can get some treatment from your physician, but it's not irreversible. So you really want to pay attention to those early warning signs of, of the higher frequency exposures. Uh, some really good resources. These are out of the UK. They're written in general language. I find that uh, probably one of the, the better written documents to try to explain why vibration is an issue we should be concerned about. So if you just Google hand arm vibration, good practice guide, and the same for whole body, you'll be able to get a copy of those. They're PDFs. They allow you to use them and distribute them as long as you give them um, uh, recognition. There's also some good information on the health and safety executive uh, website, again, coming out of Europe. 
Now, the reason the Europe is, is doing a little bit better than we are in Canada, again, is they actually have legislation that is very specific to how much vibration you can be exposed to. And once you're exposed to that level, you can no longer continue to operate, whether it's a drill or a piece of equipment. And so their uh, safety associations, their safety groups have, have produced uh, more documentation about control strategies and what the understanding is. Uh, as I said, if you're interested in measuring your own exposure to whole body vibration, there is a, uh, a free app, so you can, uh, you can play around with that. I would say use it as a screening tool. If you consistently measure your exposure and you find that you're in that yellow or red, then at that point you'd want to look at perhaps uh, you know, consulting with folks even at OCAL. They can come in and do an assessment to help to determine whether you've got increased risk and you'd want to implement some controls. Uh, just the other references for the presentation. Uh, we uh, do research, as we said, at the Centre for Research in Occupational Safety and Health through grants supported by the Ontario Ministry of Labour, WSIB, uh, Heritage Funding Corporation, Goodman School of Mines and NSERC. So thank you very much and uh, I think we may have a few minutes for questions. So Mel, you could come back up here as well. So I don't know if there are questions either online or questions from the audience. Do we have any questions from the audience? And Chelsea's checking online right now to see if anyone online has any. Okay, excellent. Oh, here we go. Where can you get the vibration gloves for home use? So you can purchase them from, you're gonna likely have to go within the Sudbury region to one of the safety uh, supply stores. I recently actually just checked that your Canadian Tires or Home Depot and Lowe's and they don't carry any anti-vibration gloves. They may say impact or, but if they don't have that standard, what you wanna do is read the fine print and it should have that ISO standard on it in order to be able to say that it's truly a, a vibration glove. So if you go to, you know, Susie Sallow Safety, Auckland Grandeur, I'm not saying that correctly, but some of those, the, the, the suppliers that will service the, the, your, your industry, uh, they should have very specific, but it needs to say that ISO standard. They have to be full fingered. If they are selling them to you as a vibration glove and they don't have fingers, that is not an anti-vibration glove. It may deal with impact in the hand, but it is not dealing with vibration. Uh, so it has to be a full fingered and it has to say that ISO or ANSI standard on it. I had a question. Uh, when we're talking about things like, clearly for like low back pain, there's so many different reasons that that could be. But if we're talking about things like Reno's, are there other uh, causes for Reno's, or is it just like, is it if if a if a worker shows up with with that diagnosis, then we should be looking at vibration? There, there are non-occupational uh, exposure causes, so some people could have Raynaud's of non-occupational origin, so your physician would do the initial assessment to determine whether there were other underlying uh, factors, and then if those are ruled out, you know, a proper work history should then give some indication, okay, maybe vibration is a factor, and then that, that individual could be sent for testing to determine whether they have uh, hand-arm vibration syndrome. online questions, Tammy. Uh, how does this pertain to riding lawnmowers at home? Riding lawnmowers, you want to do that one? <laughs> and Val's like, uh, I don't know, sure? Okay, she said no. Uh, okay, riding lawnmowers. So, yeah, so again, depending on how long your exposure is, right? Remember, we need to know duration of exposure. So if you're someone who's you know, riding a lawnmower uh, for a short period of time, you maybe don't have a really huge lawn. Yes, you would have whole body vibration exposure, but it's probably of a low enough um, uh, exposure magnitude duration that you're not at increased risk for uh, back problems. Now, having said that, if your regular job exposes you to whole body vibration and you really like your riding, riding lawnmower, like you're on it for a good three, four hours on the weekend, every other day, you're doing your neighbor's lawn, maybe you have an, a large acreage, then yeah, there's a possibility that that additional exposure combined with possibly your occupational exposure could put you at increased risk for a vibration-related injury like low back, neck problems. Um, so you could use the free, I, uh, I have no, I don't make any, uh, anything from that, but you could, if you're worried about it, you could do the initial screening using that, that tool um, to determine whether you're in the yellow or the red. Okay, and Tammy, as a follow-up to that, someone's actually asking, what is the name of the app? 
Um, I think I had the link there for where you can get it. Uh, I can't remember exactly what the app's called, but if you go to that website, if you go to um, ergonomicsuk.edu.au, basically, if you search there, or just send me an email and I'll send you the direct link. I can't tell you at the top of my head, but that's it, the pretty picture what it looks like. Could they just search for vibration in the app store? Yeah, yeah I think so. Is yeah. that what you did? Yeah. Mallory probably should answer that question. No, I'm good. <laughs> okay, I've got another one for you from online. How do we know which any vibration gloves are best other than their ratings? Do you want to answer that? No? No. I'm going to make you answer one yet. Uh, again, really, as long as they've, if they've been tested and they're certified, then they're going to, as Mallory said, they're going to uh, be able to say, okay, yes, we're going to attenuate at those higher frequencies, so above 200 hertz, and we're not going to amplify at the lower frequencies. But if you're really concerned, then you know it may be that there's additional testing required. So you would want to have some, some evaluation of what is the frequency that the tools that you're using are exposing you to, and then you could consult with some of the um, manufacturers to determine what their gloves have been tested for. Um, but really, if they're not stamped and certified, then you don't have any indication that they're actually attenuating the higher frequencies. So you want to make sure it says that that certification. But I think also, as, as Mallory alluded to, gloves are just, they're sort of your last barrier. I mean, what I would be encouraging people to do is to talk to the equipment manufacturers and see if there's some better tools that are there that are going to uh, reduce your overall exposure. So if we can get the admissions values down, and, and there are uh, uh, tools that are being improved all the time, and particularly driven by the legislation that's in place in the UK. So for equipment manufacturers to sell their tools in Europe, they actually have to be able to prove that they will reduce their, they won't expose a worker above that standard over a typical eight hour day. So there's, there's improvements that are being made all the time. And so I think it's maybe asking, are there better tools that will have lower exposure? And then considering gloves as sort of your last option. I've got another one here. Is, is it the stance of the MOL to utilize the EU vibration thresholds as best practice, i.e that they would enforce it? Uh, I can't speak for the Ministry of Labor, so I'm not sure if we have any Ministry of Labor reps here. Uh, the best of my understanding within Canada, again, there is no specific legislation or criterion value, so uh, what the Ministry of Labor could use is that general duty clause. And uh, in terms of then what value they would recommend, typically if we're asked to go in and do measurements for a company, if, they're, if they've been concerned about their exposure, we'll indicate where they're lying with respect to the ISO standards. And in many cases, we'll often indicate where they're lying with respect to the EU guidelines as well. And then that information they can use to make decisions about control strategies within the workplace. Just back to the riding lawnmower. It is an occupational riding lawnmower used for six hours a day. You want to jump in now? Six hours one more. Um, yeah, so again, um, as Tammy mentioned, I would say that if, if it is an occupational exposure, so being six hours a day and um, continuous, depending on how long, um, how many shifts they're having per weekend over the summer, then I would say that they definitely could be um, at risk for low back uh, injury or uh, other disorders associated with whole body vibration. So again, um, if, there, if there is manufactured um, guidelines for um, what the vibration emissions are for that um, equipment or again, use something like the, um, the app to provide a screening tool or have uh, measurements done. But definitely there would be a risk if it's used in an uh, occupational uh, setting in that regard. Okay, any other questions at all? Oh, yes, we do. Okay. So if you were going to use the app, is there a specific location? Is it like just in your pocket is fine? Down on like on tape, duct taping it to the seat? Like? Yeah, so what you do want to, uh, where you are, um, oops, sorry, well, I guess I can show um, but anyway so what you do want to have is um, put it on the chair so if you're again obviously the app is more for is for the whole body vibration so um, I don't know if Tammy or I could demonstrate either one. 
Um, so what you do want to do is, is the app does show you how to arrange it. So you do want to make sure that you have the axes in the correct direction, but you do want to um, secure it as best as possible. So when we did some uh, field testing measurements, we actually had it in a rubber seat pad, um, but that was uh, designed ourselves. But when, what you do want to do is at least try and duct tape it down so that it is secure, and then you do want to sit on it um, right on, um, you know, right on the buttocks uh, area and try not to, um, to shift around too much, although it is not... Um, it's not as comfortable, obviously, when it's just like that with the duct tape. Um, having it in the rubber seat pad is somewhat more comfortable, but again, just as a, as a screening tool that uh, is, uh, is available out there for free, um, it has been showing that it is, uh, it is working well. Yeah, and, and when you go to that website, they have a guidebook that tells you how to, how to use it. And we've produced one as well for the mining industry, so it could be adapted for construction. So if you send us an email, we can send you the guidebook that we created that walks you through step by step how to use it. This is going to be our last question. Okay, I'll keep it brief. Uh, do you know if Canada's moving in the direction of legislation toward this? I don't think they are, and I, I mean, I think the legislation question is, is challenging. Um, there's pros and cons to, to legislation. Obviously, it, it can be a driver for, for change, and, and we are seeing some positive changes in, in Europe. But I know they're also struggling. There are some challenges also with, with implementation in terms of enforcement. So if somebody is above, are there enough individuals there that can actually be evaluating all the industries where there's vibration exposure? I, I think from some of the work that Mallory's been doing, really what we, and events like this are perfect, it's, it's getting the awareness out. Because in, in many cases, individuals aren't even uh, aware that vibration can expose them to increased risk for injury. So if we can get awareness of vibration out, start the conversation, have conversations with the Joint Health and Safety Committee about what vibration levels are, are uh, is the worker being exposed to, and then what are some of the controls that we can start to implement then that's really, uh, I think, the direction. And OCAL is a great resource. They've got information on vibration. They've got people there that can come and help do an initial screening. And uh, obviously, if, if it's a bigger research question, we've got people locally in Sudbury that can take on those larger research questions to then work with our partners to come up with some solutions. So uh, I think awareness is key. Thank you. Well, I'd like to thank Tammy and Mallory uh, for coming today.